lot and welcome to a new series. And where better to start than... You already started Sonic Reviews though. Look, I just didn't like the fast talk gimmick, okay? It made the thing how to fucking record to edit, so I'm changing the format. Oh, thank fuck, I could barely understand you. You didn't seem like you couldn't understand me. In fact, you just looked really tired. Yes, tired of your shit. Honestly, I can't even argue with that. What happened to your sunglasses anyway? It's winter, why would I wear sunglasses? Right, so Sonic the Hedgehog. No, not that one. Or that one. There we go. So, the first game in the series. Now, I could go into a history lesson about how a rabbit with grabby ears wound up becoming a human dating fat man abusing hippie. But noting that you're on the channel called Sonic Meerkat, which is as tiny as it is, I'm going to guess that you're already part of the fandom. And if not, see you at work. Story. There is none. Nah, no, just kidding. This was back when the series actually gave a shit about story. Like, look, there's a cutscene. Now, obviously, it was mostly used for, like, bases of cartoons and comics, like, you know, the infamous Sonic Bible. But, since Adventure Roundup going with the Japanese canon, where Sonic's from Earth, not Bombius, we'll read that manual. Uh, can anyone read Japanese? Look, it's a fucking... There's a fucking pandemic. What do you really expect from me? To... Me to get one fucking imported. Or printed at the library. You're a fucking retard, you know that. Okay, so the story isn't actually important. The only thing we really need to know is bad guy wants to make an empire bigger than Britain's and blue hippie wants to stop him to save his animal friends. The story lacks the complexity which is present inside of the sequels on the same console. But at the same time, the story lacks the terrible writing of the 2010 era games, so it doesn't negatively impact the game. Foreshadowing. Why did you say that? These people are Sonic fags like me, they already knew that, and even if they weren't, you just spoiled them of the general direction that I was gonna go with the overarching reviews. I mean, don't other YouTube analysts point out their foreshadowing? Yes, and that's why your character exists, so I can make passive-aggressive remarks about the genre that I'm currently participating in. Like what? Having a live-action sketch mid-review? Anyway, let's talk about the gameplay. Why does it feel like I've procrastinated for a year and a half? Because you have. Fuck. I guess I should finish this before my greys become visible. Your what? Well, anyway... So you know how in Mario Odyssey you can press a button to crouch and then you can roll? Well, imagine that roll is subject to Half-Life physics. Why are you comparing a game from the 90s to modern releases? Because it was ahead of its time. Oh, for fuck's sake. Seriously, though. If you compare Sonic to other platformers at the time, like Mario, you realise that the level design is way less blocky. What about Mario 3 and Marble Zone? Okay, so Sonic had far more emphasis on slopes to the point that they do full loops. At least in the first stage, like with many other Sonic games. They tend to put their best foot forwards inside of the first zone, for better or worse. Speaking of which... Nope, I'm out. What? It's been five minutes and there's already a fucking Green Hill Zone. Well, yeah, it's the first stage. God damn it! Man. He is really sick of modern era, ain't he? Well, anyway. So as you can see if my blurry footage isn't too fucked, 
This game has a, some amazing sprite art. The background alone has six scrolling layers with changing colour palettes to add animation. And just looking at the backgrounds, we can see the decline in the amount of details put into them. From dropping animation, to dropping the side vertical scrolling, to slight jumping quality at scrap rate. Sure, not really related to Green Hill, but it's interesting to see just how much the first stage gets prioritised graphically. Of course, one negative to graphical fidelity. Stop saying complicated words, you don't sound smart, you sound fucking pompous. Is that they use a larger pixel count. And well, with how big the pixels are in this era of gaming, yeah, Sonic's fat ass takes up so much of the screen. To such a point that running max speed when you jump, you'll land at the edge of your vision. Which, of course, only seeing the next jump in a platformer is like playing Minecraft with blindness. Perfectly doable, but god damn the levels need to be designed around it. So is Green Hill designed around this? For the most part, yes. With having minimal platforming, which mostly consists of multiple pathways which reward memorization and speedrunning, while only punishing shit players with a longer time. Now, this is the main reason why I do enjoy Sonic games so fucking much, because on your first playthrough, you are inevitably going to be crap. And instead of punishing first timers, it allows them to progress through the game seeing the variety it has to offer, while allowing for challenging portions as early as the first level. Yes, I shown SA2 is a masterclass in platforming with decent draw distance. Like I plan to put SA2 footage in this. Why why didn't I have a rep oh yeah, because of fucking hiatus. Anyway, that's the theory anyway, and FYI, this will be the main way I judge the quality of Sonic games, if it's fun on both first playthrough and the millionth. So does Green Hill achieve this? Well, for the most part. There's clear violations of this design practice with the magnetary spiky bombless pit section because why should invulnerability save you in the first area? Generally though, it's more so trying to kill your momentum than actually damage or kill you. Though without the spin dash, it does make getting up ramps or through destructible walls a fucking pain. Finally, the end stage. So collecting 50 rings without losing them, you get to play a mini game, which should reward you with lives and continues, but it never does for me. More importantly though, it's just another bit of game design to cater to two different skill levels in a single stage. A basic run just to the end for the casuals and a no damage run for the virgins. While I am a virgin, this game lacks a save feature and any content related to Supersonic. In fact, it lacks a 7th Chaos Emerald, so canonically it would make sense. Nice touch of Sonic Team of Old, even if you did just add your Dragon Ball Z fan character into canon. At least you made it cohesive. Piss Hedgehog aside, on the third act, yes this game lacks a two act structure of latter games, you encounter the boss at the end. Holy shit, just like every fucking video game ever? When did you find your sunglasses? Yeah, it turns out a year is enough time to find them. But, but you weren't gone for that long. Yeah, it's been longer. No, no, I mean, fuck it. So yeah, it's just a classic wrecking ball. It just swings from side to side with clear spots to hide in, but unlike most bosses with blind spots, you actually have to leave them to deal damage. So it's a fairly well designed first boss. Piss easy enough to not cause deaths, but involved enough to teach players that they have to hit fat people, but not in their balls. 
That has to be one of the most forced jokes ever. Dude, it was going to be a transition. How could you possibly transition from that? Like this. So if you want to talk about Whiplash so bad, it feels like a big hit in the balls, then the switch between the speed focus shortcuts of Green Hill to the one block jumps like it's a fucking Minecraft parkour map of Marble Zone is one of the biggest Jackson positions in design, especially with the fucking waiting sections. That was plain awful. Dude, I added Miley Cyrus onto blurry footage. What type of fucking quality do you expect? True. The only thing worse than your quality is your upload schedule. Alright, yeah, Labyrinth is an oddball. It looks nice and has enjoyable platforming sections, at least when you aren't waiting for slowly moving blocks to launch you like the end of Corona Mountain. Yeah, people want to talk about games that didn't age well. Fucking hell, the 3D Mario series really didn't stand up. And yes, I will fight you on this, Nintendo fans. Hey, remember when this was a Sonic review? Right. But yeah, the main thing that balances this stage's difficulty spike is the rings, funnily enough. Mostly because the lava can't insta-kill you. And again, due to the special stages, it makes a clear split between new players damage boosting through everything until the lava geysers force them to wait, and an experienced players actually doing the platforming to get the special stages. Speaking of which, let's actually talk about them to extend this shorter section, because the boss literally just takes a flaming hot shit on the platform. Thank you for that image. As for the special stages I forgot to talk about before, basically you're trapped in a washing machine trying to jump to a crystal before you fall in holes and die. That has to be the worst explanation ever. Well, completing six only gives you flowers, so I skip them. They could have some cool design, but noting they aren't enjoyable mechanically, and just being a huge gimmick, eh, not much was lost. But yeah, the stage is just meh. It's not bad, but it's such a huge departure from what the first stage was. Which, sadly, we'll see a lot more of as we continue this series. That is if I record any more fucking videos! I hope you like Whiplash, because we're Back to the physics playgrounds! Sadly, there isn't much to talk about in terms of level design since you just get sprung up to high platforms from inside pits full of BOUNCE PAD! Pads. BOUNCE PAD! Oh, that's such an old Bounce joke! Pad. Pad. Even when I Bounce wrote pad. it! Bounce 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 that game Bounce came out in like 2016 or something? Fucking hell! <laughs> and fucking annoying springs. So running through cramp corridors. There's also unfitting spike balls. The start of this game's fetish with them. So let's instead take this moment to talk about the aesthetic. So I already talked about the level of detail that makes Sonic Sprite use up so many pixels that his fat ass uses as much screen space as a 3D platformer character would except without the benefit of perspective. Well, let's actually talk about how the zoom allows some details to actually pop. Green Hill with its waterfalls and mountainous backdrop traveling into a forest closer to mountains to enter a purple temple with a lot of lava and green to contrast. And of course, Spring Yard with the city background and bright red foreground making some really nice contrast. Oh, and of course, Labyrinth going to lower levels of the stage exposes foliage, giving some perspective to the verticality. And since I've assumed people have at least seen Sonic 1 before, and since I've assumed people have at least seen Sonic 1 before, that's why I made a joke about there being a two-act structure, which everyone would be fucking groaning at. Great writing, Leon. 
Labyrinth just looks like crap in my opinion. The texture work is still on the same level, but a brown, t just, just a brown tiled floor with the water and the spikes not even being affected by the water filter just makes the stage look naff. Starlight returns to the quality with nice starry night sky, which I'll admit, living with light pollution makes the sky look like it's been set on fucking fire and I hate it. Then Scrap Brain is split into multiple art cells based on the act and holy fuck, I'll save that analysis for the actual level segment. So after jumping in the blended bowls you perform on the precursor to Chemical Plant Anxiety and fight against Eggman, who is this time trying to fucking impale you and holy shit the force he comes at you with is enough to tear apart the ground below you. You certainly know how to make the simplest boss in the game sound graphic. Speaking of which, if you are stupid enough to die, like you were, then there's an invincibility box right behind you which can make you cocky enough to just jump below Eggman which is a mistake because even if you're on the corner of a block while he's jump while jumping, you'll just fall down the newly created gap. So yeah, not sure if that's a glitch or punishing idiots. Definitely just you being stupid. Well, good thing I enjoy good punishment. Comet is not your only fans. Speaking of which, subscribe to Next. Taboo. Wait, you didn't talk about the enemies yet. Oh, for you were the one who skipped. It was for the greater good. Anyway, Caterkillers, you spin Nash from the front, and Spike Crabs, you can also spin Nash from the front. They both hurt you attacking from any other direction and buzz bombers fly over you with a projectile that travels the speed of other platformers. Except you can yeet yourself with your velocity making them non-existent. Better? Sure, I was honestly more concerned with destroying your work. What, like you're an analogue for annoying YouTube commenters except you don't sound like a snivelling little twat? No more than you do. On the nose hit or miss meta humour aside, let's stop the lane and get to talking about that stage. So every game has those levels that everyone unanimously agrees are terrible, and if it doesn't, it's a micro game which can be considered a masterpiece. So, Labyrinth Zone is um, not fun, let's say that. And no, it's not because of the water, don't get me wrong, it killing your momentum and forcing you to stop for air frequently does destroy the pace, not slowing it down like the non-auto sections in marble, no, like, the full-on pace breaking for you to entirely stop platforming, much like the full auto sections in Marble Zone. Not only that, but my weird time to explain the enemies till now had a purpose. So the enemies have overall been either spikes or easily manipulated gimmicks. Which, for a game where platforming is core, yet yeah, the enemies shouldn't be fucking Dark Souls bosses. So, how about the Labyrinth bots? Well, the most common hide on the ground with their snoots barely visible, ready to give Sonic the most painful brown nose ever. They are thankfully destroyable just as the ball and them jumping up makes it guaranteed that they'll get out of your way if you jump. It's just if you don't notice them, then they'll waste your time. But of course, this is a water level, so wasted time is the last thing you want if you don't want to drown. Another is a floating ball with red shells around them which aren't hard to avoid until one particular placement where he throws them down a narrow corridor and this time the slow projectile speed works to your disadvantage because by the time you land your stupidly floaty water jump the fuck has blocked the hallway again just so you have to wait 
which of course will lead to a lack of air which will force you to backtrack. Luckily not so far that his orbiters respawn, but it is still a pain in the arsehole. So safe to say the enemies actually have an impact this stage, but they can't get much worse, right? Wrong. Platforms on tracks basically repeating the whole marbles on lava block bullshit, but this time with spikes and drowning, hooray! But yeah, the stage itself isn't so painful, just some annoying sections like a water slide that wants to pull you in all the time, or water corridors and spiked rooms. The boss fight is where shit truly gets painful. So, checkpoints. One pattern you may have noticed is pre-boss points never have rings beyond them. You always have to backtrack. Here, you're stuck in a room where, you, where there's zero rings, and the path to the boss itself is a long stair climb that took the piss and I sped up in my let's play to show my pain without boring the audience. How nice of me. You just didn't want that time to be entirely cut and wasted. Well, would you? Please. Like, I got much of a life to live since you got too depressed to do YouTube. Well, ignoring that darkness, let's bitch about video games. Cause that's all you get at. Okay, that's it. Whoa, what the fuck? Wait a minute, the law. Wait, hey, fuck, that means he's still alive. Eh, uh, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, thankfully there is a shield, but they aren't nearly as useful as a ring you can repeatedly grab. So the boss itself, well I say boss, it's more like a parkour course that requires you to stop and start while you have the water rising with no bubbles within. If you ever wanted a panic attack, just load up this boss fight because, well, this platforming challenge is more lenient than it looks, but because of the framing, your instincts of avoiding drowning makes you yeet yourself into every spike physically possible, and fuck, there's a lot of them retracting. Of course, you don't have to kill the boss just to make it to the end, so it is at least lenient in that sense, but when it's a segment of a fucking Kaizo, it seems more like a mercy than good game design. So fun returns back to the game with these slot heavy stages that actually uses Sonic's momentum. Of course not that much. There's more emphasis on gimmicks, but again, they do include seesaws, which do use the build-up of momentum to use them as springs. Other than that, it's just a decent stage with touch-activated platforms for if you miss the momentum jumps, because there's no spin dash, and creepers with shrapnel. Then yeah, we get to the boss fight, so this game remembering what game design is reintroduces the gimmick from the stage and uses it as a method of damaging the boss, either by launching yourself into him, launching the spike into him, or absolutely cheesing him because you're better than me. I did take a while to beat this boss but eh, I enjoyed it more than Labyrinths cause while both my issues were just sucking, this boss was far less punishing thanks to the short respawn and actually having rings and no hard time limit. Well, aside stage completion, but let's be real, nobody who's making it this far is taking 10 minutes on stages. So remember me about going on about degradation of style? <laughs> no, he's so cute when he's passed out from a concussion. No. Isn't he cute when he's passed out from a concussion? Anyway. So, the return of animated backgrounds and even differing themes for all the three acts to such a point, I gotta. Honestly, this is a really 
fun, solid and difficult platforming stage which takes advantage of multiple paths for difficulty scaling. Like, in my let's play where I ace the level going one way but trying for a faster path, I just completely made myself look retarded with how many times I died. Only thing I could really complain about is how much slower the lower paths are and some of the traps are pretty bullshit but let's be real this is the final zone it ain't going to be that easy and making lives harder to keep is the main hallmark of rising difficulty. And I will definitely say I love the mechanical aesthetic. It definitely helps build from natural environments to the more industrial ones. Even if the robots are used just from previous stages. So now we travel indoors where the quality sort of falters. The gravity balls work just fine but the obscene amount of sores, fire and electricity combined with the amount of rings, yeah it's very cheesable. I did admittedly die quite a bit on this level though, mostly through continuing those bad habits which the ring light system encourages. That and those fucking conveyor belts which make jumps stupid difficult and the cross traps in the upper part. Obviously the penultimate act should be difficult but it really seems like that one level suffers from difficulty spikes within itself and not in the sense that the upper path starts with crush traps and the lower path is cheesable, more so in the sense that the amount of precision suddenly increases towards the end and never reaches that point again in the next stage. Speaking of which... So, after a cutscene that stage transitions, you end up in Labyrinth Act 4, but this time it's been bleached. Other than setting off your PTSD, the stage is actually piss fucking easy since it pretty much only uses water underwater spikes as obstacles. It does at least have some framing from falling down then climbing your way back up but yeah. This is the most forgettable stage in the entire game, which is a shame for the final level. So you start the stage with zero rings and you jump straight into the final boss fight. Sounds like a bad combination doesn't it? Surprisingly, it works due to the boss itself being slow and predictable while avoiding cheese. You could hide in the corner but then you'll miss out on half of your attack opportunities and importantly, the secondary attack actually homes in on your position. So going to the far edges actually makes it harder to avoid. So when you only got one hit it's not really worth the risk. And obviously the main attack is crushing which actually adds a little more leniency since you have no hit points anyway. And of course hiding to one side gives you less options to escape. The thing that makes this boss so good is all of its design encourages the player to stick towards the centre while keeping them on the edge since at this point even if you're using save states one hit can send you back and with how slow the fight is the sudden loss of leniency with health isn't unfair unlike Labyrinth Zone which boss is also mechanically more difficult than the ones before it. So this bit I'm going to be jump cutting just because I wrote this script like a year and a half ago so it's not in my fucking head so you know yeah <laughs> So Sonic 1 it's a game obviously it's not terrible but it definitely suffers from first game syndrome with how many failed ideas there are You'll see within the sequels that platform heavy sections, unlike Marble Zone, get relegated to upper sections instead of their whole acts. Then of course there's the force rating sections being gone in favour for straight lines versus a lower path where you go down and you go slowly climb back up, making that time penalty without slowing down the pace of the game. 
and water is a lot more avoidable, mostly being in the lower sections as well. Obviously there are aspects which are really fun, such as the momentum building for big shortcuts, or memorising the upper paths, which are genuinely more fun to play and led to most of my deaths because I don't remember them. <laughs> Could just be you avoiding waiting sections because you're impatient. Ah, you're coming around. How long have I been filming? Who knows? All I know is fucking hell, you're batshit crazy. Heh, <laughs> bat. Nice one. Oh, oh, fuck off. Well, anyway, yeah. So, this game does say a good foundation. But it definitely lacks the polish that its sequels would have, which makes them some of the most memorable platformers of all time. But it does definitely set a good foundation, so how would I rate the game? <laughs> yeah, this might be a controversial opinion. Obviously, I don't think these two games are completely equal. One... One has way more content, but it reaches lower lows than Labyrinth Zone. But it also reaches greater heights than Green Hill, uh, Starlight, first half of Scrap Brain. <laughs> Whatever. The other one, at least, has the dignity to not demand 10 playthroughs for the ending, so... On average, about the same. I do have a method for displaying my ratings without objective ranking, but noting they're both mediocre games, I'm not going to risk putting one above the other when I would prefer to play literally anything else outside Heroes. <laughs> but the main thing is, could I recommend these games? Uh, not on its own. Thankfully though, the classics are bundled a million times over. From Mega Collection to their Classics Collection on the DS, to the mobile ports, to these Steam versions that probably get sales every time there's a fucking Humble Bundle. Or you could just fucking emulate it, because you have like 10 fucking copies laying around. Because the game is as rare as Minecraft Coal in 1.16 because 1.17 has made Coal only appear up in higher levels for some fucking reason. <laughs> but this is an old script. Now if you want a specific recommendation, make a collection on the PS2 or Classics Collection on the DS because their controllers have the D-pad where your thumb naturally goes which is more comfortable to fucking play one of the few times I prefer a PlayStation controller <laughs> they're dirt cheap and they come with Sonic 3 and Knuckles which Sega can't be fucked to deal with the contractual issues with the music with anymore <laughs> But yeah, this game is a curiosity. I put this on the level of mediocre main series games. Though, at least this one has the dignity to end quickly. And at least gives a good challenge if you're trying for a perfect emerald run. Where in 2010 games, I can S rank first try. I couldn't even get past Marble Zone without a game over, so while I don't enjoy the game that much, it at least kept me engaged while playing through it. And hell, this classic Sonic is more engaging than the Forces one, but now I'm getting ahead of myself, so it's time to wrap it up. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, if you didn't, why are you watching? Did you just want to see me batter someone's head in? You're sick. <laughs> hey, did you see why we all... Ah, my question is, how, how did it take you so long to ask? I fucking passed out! Oh, I 
Didn't I pass out? I know. Maybe blood loss? It's, nah. It, it can't be that. I'm feeling a little lightheaded.